I'm director of the Anlinger Center for Energy and the Environment here at Princeton. And uh, uh, this is the first of our highlight seminars for this year. I'll just uh, shamelessly advertise for one moment. Uh, there will be one seminar per month for the fall semester. The next one will deal with solar energy conversion. There'll be one on energy economics and one on, on storage, on energy storage later on. Um, but we're delighted today to have uh, Dr. Arun Majumdar talk to us today. Um, I'm not going to do the introduction. I'm going to leave that to uh, my colleague who um, has known, known Arun much longer than I have. But one uh, housekeeping note, please turn off your cell phones because we're recording and there are problems with feedback. And the other thing is, if you ask a question, please wait until, uh, we will have Q&A afterward, wait until you receive a microphone uh, so that your question can be recorded. If you have a burning question during the, the, the seminar, then we'll just ask um, our distinguished speaker to repeat the question so that it gets recorded. Uh, so, I want to introduce my colleague, Robert Sokolow, who directs, co-directs the Carbon Mitigation Initiative here at Princeton and uh, also directs the Energy Grand Challenge Initiative here. Um, he's my colleague in mechanical and aerospace engineering. And so I won't spend any more time introducing him because he's going to tell you about our speaker today. Thank you, Thank you Emily, and greetings, everyone. <laughs> it's a privilege to uh, introduce Arun Majumdar to you this afternoon as the Anlinger Center's first highlight seminar speaker for the new academic year. In the summer of 2009, Arun accepted President Obama's call to come to Washington to become the founding director of ARPA-E, the Advanced Research Projects Administration hyphen energy. Arun weighed a separation from his wife and two teenage daughters in Berkeley against the demands of a deeply felt patriotism and patriotism won out. Arun, as you will learn, is a man of deep commitments. He has many accomplishments of his life before ARPA-E. He was a member of the National Academy of Engineering, elected in 2005. He worked on nanoscale materials. He is a material scientist. And he was, has been, and now again, is professor of mechanical engineering material science at Berkeley. And he led the Lawrence Berkeley Lab's uh, program in energy and environment which was a, a major job of, of administration, Bef these all before he went to Washington. But from the vantage of 2012, these accomplishments seem like preparation. ARPA-E has been Arun's signature achievement. It is an immensely difficult task to create a new organization that lasts. And before Arun, there was the concept of ARPA-E, but there was no implementation. The assignment was to create programs <coughs> to translate science into a broad spectrum of potentially game-changing energy technologies. This is, if you like, Pasteur's quadrant, where basic science makes a difference for real applications. And it has been a wish, Arun made it happen, with only 300 to 400 million dollars a year to spend, he creates, has created bridges to crossing what is known as the valley of death between the basic science idea and commercial activity. He, our, our, ARPA E is an organization, this is quoting from something that was written about him, with a culture of speed, efficiency, transparency, and integrity. I wouldn't mind having an organization I built, developed known in that way. Uh, he's granted more than $500 million to more than 180 projects in 12 project areas in just three years. His annual innovation summits, some of our students have gone there, maybe some of you have gone there, have become a near mandatory event for entrepreneurs, investors, policymakers, thought leaders, and other stakeholders in the clean energy space. And perhaps most remarkable of, of all at this given time, ARPA -E has bipartisan support. At this time, almost anything a Democrat thinks is a good idea, a Republican announces is a bad idea, and vice versa. And ARPA -E has survived all of that. Arun is a person of great warmth, and much of the secret of his success is due to these personal qualities. The title of his talk today is A New Industrial Revolution for a Sustainable Energy Future. Welcome, Arun. Can you hear me at the back? 
Well, Rob, thanks a lot for that really warm introduction. Emily, thank you so much for inviting. And it was, it's a real pleasure to be here again and you know, connecting and reconnecting with some people. Um, what I thought I'll do is to, you know, the title is there, but it's really a, a more elaboration of a paper that Secretary Chu and I wrote um, that appeared um, in the middle of last month. August 16th is when it came out. And um, I'll go through some of the, it, it provides a sort of a, um, a techno-economic landscape, a snapshot of where we are in energy globally and where we are likely to go. And so I'll, I'll go into describing that. And you know, we could not cover all of energy. For example, we did not cover the grid, which is immensely important. We also did not cover energy efficiency because we just did not have space out there. I mean, to write about all of energy is, is difficult in a, in a small review paper. But I'll talk a little bit about that in this talk. But before I go into it, I thought I'll give you an idea of what it was like putting this paper together. So it was about May. I left DOE in June. It was about May then that Nature connected, uh, contacted me and said, hey, could you write a little piece? We have four review papers coming along. Uh, if you, could you write a little piece, cover piece for, of 1,800 words? And I thought about it and said, well, you know, instead of just me doing it, let me you know, walk over to Secretary Chu's office and ask him, hey, would you be interested in collaborating and writing? And it turns out that Nature had asked him too without realizing that we actually talked to each other. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he said that, you know, they asked me too, why don't we just collaborate? and, uh, and co-author a paper together. Uh, we said, we went, you know, uh, got back to, to Nature, said, hey, we'll collaborate. They were extremely happy. He said, both of us, we got both of them to write a paper. <laughs> Little did we realize what we were getting into because we had a deadline. And we, um, you know, we said that, okay, we got into the paper, writing the paper, and I had already left you, he was there. And, you know, we realized we don't have students and postdocs. <laughs> helping us. It's, it's just the two of us. So we, you know, student postdocs, fixing references, doing literature search, we had to do everything ourselves. To the point that we spent some all-nighters. We had about four all-nighters to fix every format on the references, getting the figures right, and everything, detail. And it, it was typically going like this. I'll give you a particular example. He would send me the paper at 3 in the morning, Washington time, after working on it all night. And I would then get it at midnight back in California. I would work till four in the morning and send it back to him. And he would get it at seven then, and he would work for a little and go to work. And then in the middle of the day, he would call me and say that, hey, Arun, tonight I can work only for two hours. Uh, or, and I got to meet the president. I got a few senators to talk to. I've got this nuclear issue to deal with. You know, what about you? <laughs> And I had to put up a straight face. I was at home. He said, uh, Mr. Secretary, I've got to walk the dog. I've got to cook lunch for my kids. I've got to pick them up from piano practice. I can spend four hours for you. <laughs> that, that, that's, the, that's the story that nature does not have in this paper. But that's how it, this paper came around. So in this paper, we talk about the Industrial Revolution. And, and we call for a new Industrial Revolution. We are not the first ones to call. But we sort of explain what that is. So before I go into it, let me, let's just look back at our industrial revolution, at our modern lifestyle, and how it came around. The industrial revolution, in fact, in this paper, we say it's horsepower to horsepower. Um, in fact, if you go back in history, you know, 200, 250 years ago, that's how mobility happened. We either walked or we used horses or animal power to, can you see that? Oh, that's even better. I think there's a light out here. No, that's okay. We have a, we have a, uh... Anybody have a flashlight? <laughs> it's easier for me to put everyone to sleep now. This is good. <laughs> okay. So this, is, this, is, this was horsepower and essentially animal power. And we turn into things like this. Okay. This is now what we do. We go to the grocery store with 300 horses taking us there in a car. Or we take the, you know... Um, uh, a high-speed train uh, with 10,000 horses 
driving us there, and we fly across the continent, you know, in a matter of five or six hours, which used to take months, uh, you know, in, in 100,000 horses, okay? And that's not just transportation. We have changed the way we make things. We've mechanized agriculture. And in our homes now, we have new devices, new gadgets for lighting, where we used to use whale oil, whale blubber, to, to light our homes. And now we use you know, compact fluorescent lights, LEDs, and we use air conditioners to create a climate like California in, in Singapore. And that's what we do, OK? And that all has come around because of how we utilize energy. It is a matter of how the energy utilization has been transformed. And that's what is the fundamental basis of industrial revolution. And so if you look at the impact of that, the, the global GDP per capita, per person GDP, the productivity, or you can call it prosperity, related to prosperity, and it has, exp has gone up exponentially. And if you look at the fossil, the energy use, and they're not the same, X scale is not the same, that has also increased exponentially, and it's been mostly because of how we access and utilize fossil energy. That's, that's been the history, and that has been a dramatic increase. This is prosperity, this is GDP per capita. Now, if you look at the number of people, when the Industrial Revolution started, there were 700 million people in this world, and now we have 7 billion, so it's gone up 10x. So here's what, what the world population looks like, all the way from Stone Age, and now this is what is going on right now. And in the, in the recent history, if you look at the population, it was going along a certain rate, and then boom, it, it increased because of, of technology, of science and engineering, into something called the Haber-Bosch process, which gives you artificial fertilizers, otherwise people would have, we would have major famines. And this, it's, a, you know, it's, it's the birth of chemi modern chemical engineering, of breaking the triple bond of nitrogen and forming ammonia, which became the precursor for, uh, for fertilizers. And that turned the population around, and we are at about 7 billion now. Where will the population go in the future? Well, this is a prediction from the United Nations. The average is 10 billion, and the error bar is also 10 billion. So it's, but that's what, you know, so let's take the average of 10 billion. We're going to add 3 more billion people to this, to this world, okay? And if you want that exponential increase in prosperity to continue, which we all want, then the question is, where does the energy come from? And of course, the point that we make is that while we've utilized energy, fossil energy in the future, we have to look at the sustainable part of energy use as well. What else? Well, if you look at the oil and gas reserves in production, we said, can we just continue to use oil? And the answer is, this is, you know, uh, this is the global oil reserves as a function of year. And what you find is there is no peak oil. And what we're finding is the technology for discovery and production keeps on improving, keeping pace with the demand for oil. And so this keeps on increasing out here. And this is, um, if you look at the global oil production capacity, this is a report that came out from Harvard recently. And in terms of, this is the, the light green is the 2011, and the dark green is the production capacity in 2020. What you find is that this is the United States. We're going to probably increase our domestic production by a significant amount, reducing our imports. This is the good news story. We will improve our, our balance of trade issues. But not just that, Canada is increasing substantially. Iraq oil will most likely come on board, et cetera. And we will have a larger production in the next eight years than what we have today, just locally in the Americas and globally as well, to the point there are predictions of global fluctuation of oil price. The price might actually come down because of that. This is on the oil side. On the gas side, this is the global gas reserves without considering US shale. And so this is now you can see, this keeps on increasing because the technology keeps on improving. And here is the US gas production capacity, and this is the shale gas, which came out of technology of horizontal drilling and fracking. So the point is that you know, we, are, we have enough fossil fuel at least to last you know, probably this century. And the question is, well, is that the major driver? I'll come to that in a few minutes. But what is not often talked about are climate. And I'm not, going to, you know, I, I'm not going to tell you about the history of climate change. I'll just show you the temperature distribution that recently came out in a paper in PNAS, or what is the global average temperature distribution. And what you find is that this temperature distribution was a Gaussian, and this is, in, on the or, this is standard deviations. 
And this distribution, we, what we talk about global warming is the average. And the average keeps on moving. And we are at about 0.8 degrees Celsius from what we used to be in the, in the past. This is the first data I've seen on the distribution. And what you find is that the distribution is not only widening, we are reaching five sigma of what the standard deviation was. So this is the first, at least first, first evidence or, or correlation between the global warming and weather extremes, which we feel around. And global warming, people are sort of separated from it because it's an average temperature of 0.8 degrees. Well, this is now a five sigma of the standard deviation what it used to be. And if you, this is the global average distribution. If you ask, where are these hotspots? Where is the five sigma happening? There is a beautiful map that came out. This is from NASA in Goddard. Um, this is the weather extreme distribution. If you look at the color coding, this pink out here is minus three sigma, below minus three sigma. That's the cold uh, you know, uh, that happens. And this is plus, above plus three sigma. These are the hot spots. These are the weather extremes on the hot side that happens. And this was 1955, uh, 65, 75. And this is 2006, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. And what you see is that, first of all, there is, if you just, you know, if you lose your eye resolution, you find that there is a warming happening, okay? But the second part that you see is that you find hotspots. For example, if you look at 2010, the hotspots near Moscow where there was a massive heat wave and there were, you know, lots of people died. There were hot, and then in 2009, you remember the winter of 2009, that was my first winter in Washington, D.C., coming from California, and that was Snowmageddon. Well, that's the cold wave that you see out here. And you can see the hotspot. The, the interesting thing is that the hotspots don't happen at the same spot. They, ha they move around. It's like a little bubble in a carpet that you try to put it out here, it comes up somewhere else. But there's an undeniable trend towards making it that you're, you're going to see weather extreme in some part of the world, and it may actually go around, but we don't know exactly when that's going to happen. And so this is, I thought, the first evidence that I'm seeing of weather extremes in a statistical manner with the global warming, which is the mean that is going around. And that, I think, is a very significant result. So if you ask the question, OK, what next? So clearly, we have to look at that and say that we need to change our mix of energy because we have enough reserves. But that's not what the driver force is. But there's a dilemma that we have to face. So if you ask the question, Historically, how much carbon have we emitted? What is a cumulative CO2 emission since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution? That's on the order of about a trillion tons of CO2. And this is over the last 250 years. You ask the question, based on known reserves today, and those known reserves are increasing, okay, because the technology is increasing, based on the known reserves of fossil fuel, okay, how much more CO2 can we emit based on the known reserves of, of fossil fuel today? And that's about 3 trillion tons. Okay? And he asked the question, how long will that take? And that's about 75 to 100 years, approximately. So we will emit three times more the CO2 in one third the time that since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. We are just, you know, 10x factor right out there. That's the trend that we are on right now. But the important factor is that those 3 trillion ton tons, 3 trillion tons of carbon that is there in a fossilized form is worth tens of trillions of dollars. So you've got to ask the question, do we leave those tens of trillions of dollars be down there because that could lead to major economic growth and all that? Or do we find some other solutions? And that's the dilemma that we are in. You can't tell the oil and gas companies, no, please don't make your $10 trillion. That's going to be hard to say unless we find better solutions. So this is a very famous quote from Sheikh Ahmed Yamani, the former oil minister. <laughs> The Stone Age did not end because we ran out of stones. And we added in this paper because we transitioned to better solutions. And this, is, and this is not the first time we are facing this. Let me give you a picture which will tell you the story. This is what a New York Avenue looked like in 1890s. And this is what it looked like in 1920s. This is Detroit. In a span of 30 years, we transformed a trans transportation system. And you know there were 160 horses in New York and Brooklyn in 1880 that were producing 3 to 4 million pounds of horse manure a day. And we, you know, there, there, were, there were lots of jobs trying to clear up the roads with the horse manure so people could walk and all that. But, you know, that was not the sustainable solution. So we just transitioned to a better solution. 
And so the question is, are there better solutions than what we have, the, the trends that we're seeing today? And as part of RPE and the Department of Energy, we were trying to see what are those better solutions that can actually be competitive and that can use market solutions to introduce new technologies that are cleaner and better. So I'm going to give you a little bit of ex a few examples of that, but it's important to look at the whole energy landscape as a system. And energy systems can, there are multiple dimensions to this. This is a two-dimensional map of two systems. One is stationary and the other is transportation. There is a supply side and there's a demand side and there's an infrastructure in between. These two systems, at least currently, are largely independent of each other. Okay? This may become dependent if electrification becomes uh, based on, if transportation becomes based on electricity. But right now they're independent of each other. You've got electricity systems out here, electricity natural gas, and you've got transportation system out here. That's just one way to look at a system. But if you're looking for better solution in each of those boxes out here, you can think of a third and a fourth dimension, which I'm going to show you. For each of the technologies, you can look at the whole scaling issue. And for energy, the two things that are very important. Number one is cost, cost and performance. And the other one is scale. If things don't scale, it doesn't matter. And if things don't come down in cost, it doesn't matter also. So if you look at any technology in one of those boxes, one of those little circles, they would follow what is called a learning curve. That means as you do more and more, the cost comes down and performance goes up. So whether you make an air conditioner or make a car, you know, the cost of a Camry has remained about the same over the last 20 years, but the quality has just improved. And that is just the performance improving and equivalent cost is coming down. Okay? So that's a learning curve. And so any technology would go through a learning curve and that you need incremental evolution or improvement in these learning curves. Well, if you want to find better solution, well, this is one way of looking at it. And, and, I'm, and this is, by the way, here's technology innovation, there's manufacturing and scaling of innovations, and there's deployment in the field and the market, et cetera. Another way of looking at creating better solutions is to do this. And by the way, I'm going to correlate all this to what DOE does. This is the applied energy programs, the energy efficiency, renewable energy, fossil energy, nuclear energy, and Office of Electricity. They all try to take technologies down a current learning curve. And it's very important to do that incremental evolutionary improvement because everything cannot be a revolution. But you've got to create some pocket of money to create the disruptive solutions which could eventually find better solutions. And that's what ARPA-E was trying to do, is trying to do. That we are trying to find solutions where initially they may be more expensive, but there's a chance that one of these opportunities will come down out here and be of lower cost and better performance. And to do that, here's where you translate science into new approaches, a portfolio of approaches, out of which you don't know which one's going to win eventually, but you've got to try them. And they will, some of them will fail. The idea just did, did not work out. But I call them not failures, but opportunities to learn and go back to the drawing board and use science to come back again. But there's a chance that one of them will come out here and will scale the right way and be disruptive to so that the nation as a whole can follow not just this initially, but transition to a new learning curve, which will be cheaper and better. And that's the search of new approaches and new innovation based on science and engineering. But this, as you do the scaling, there's, a, there's another, there's a, uh, there's a business aspect to it, and that is how much money do you need to be able to go down, go, go up in scale? Well, in the early stages out here, this is a typical DOE project, a few million dollars, two to five years, and that's fine. And you will see some failures out here, and you will see some successes, etc. But as you go into manufacturing and, and other in late stage manufacturing and product development, etc., you will need capital about orders of magnitude higher than what the government can spend. And the private sector has to be involved in it. And the access to low cost and long term capital, which has a long term of about 20 years or more, is absolutely important. At the end of the day, you want to sell these, you want to deploy this, you need markets, whether it is uh, the businesses buying it, consumers, or the US government as a procurement possibility, or of course global markets. I'll come back to this later on, because there's more meat to it where policies might actually play a role. So anyway, I'm going to show you a few examples of these, you know, of these opportunities that we were involved in early in RPE. 
So let me talk about stationary energy systems, and I'll show you some plots that we used in this nature paper of ours. So could there be better solutions that are carbon neutral or carbon free? Well, it all depends on the cost, and this is from Bloomberg New Energy Finance, the latest data of quarter three in 2012, which is now. And compared to quarter two, just the previous quarter, and these are the different ways of generating electricity. And this is the levelized cost of electricity. Levelized cost is the capital cost amortized over a certain years, all the operation cost, everything put under one number, which is the, you can then compare apples to apples out here. So the cheapest way to produce electricity is a natural gas combined cycle, uh, gas turbines, which is about 60 to $70 a megawatt hour, which is about seven cents, six to seven cents a kilowatt hour. And, and, and that is cheap because these turbines today that you can buy from GE, Alstom, and others are about 60% or even higher in efficiency, which is amazing if you think about it. And the natural gas is cheap. And that's the, that's the lowest cost that you can get. But this is coal out here. The coal out here is you know, about 90, 80 to 90 dollars a megawatt hour. But what you are finding is that wind on shore is on par or actually cheaper than coal today. This is out of, these are based not on projection, but actual contracts that have been signed. And this is actually cheaper. And if you look at solar, well, it's a little more expensive. It's about $120, $130 a megawatt hour. This is PV thin film, PV crystalline, et cetera. But what you find is that you're dropping the levelized cost of electricity by 9% in one quarter, which is an amazing drop. Now, it's not going to remain 9% every year. But if you look at the average over the last two and a half years, the price of of solar panels has dropped 70% in two and a half years, which is amazing what has happened. So what we think is likely to happen, that many of these prices that are dropping will likely come down and be cost competitive with natural gas, electricity from natural gas within this decade. And to enable that, we actually created a program in DOE. Um, and you have to ask the question, where does the cost come from? And so we created a program called Sunshot. And this is equivalent of President Kennedy's moonshot to go to the moon and return safely within the decade. Well, sunshot, we don't go to the sun, but <laughs> we want to reduce the cost of electricity from solar to $50 a megawatt hour or five cents a kilowatt hour within this decade. And see what happened. This was the, the first cost, the installed cost, the capital cost that you need to install a solar you know, system in 2004. That was about $8 a watt, which correlates to about $400 a megawatt hour. Okay, 2004, this is 2010 when we started. And our goal was to reach a dollar a watt, which is equivalent to about $50 a megawatt hour or levelized cost of electricity, okay? And if you break up the cost, there is a panel cost, which is about $1.70 per watt. This is what is called the balance of system, which is installation, permitting, everything else. And, and this is 22 cents a watt is for grid integration with, with inverters and things like that. And that was around 380 watt. And we were, uh, we, you know, we said that let's shoot it down uh, to about a dollar a watt, 50 cents for the panel, 40 cents for, you know, for the balance of system, and 10 cents for the power electronics. Okay, that was, that was the goal. And what has happened now is that the panel cost has come down from $1.70 a watt to 70 cents a watt. Okay, it's almost reaching 50 cents, and we are pretty sure by the end of this decade, we've still got eight more years, it's going to reach 50 cents a watt. What has not happened is that the balance of system has not come down as fast as we think. And that's installation, et cetera. So you ask the question, is there a technology angle to the balance of system? After all, there's a labor aspect, there's a permit, et cetera. And the, techno and the technological aspect is there are multiple, and one of them is efficiency. Can we increase the efficiency of the solar cell? Because if you can increase the efficiency, you need less number of panels, and installation becomes cheaper. Or if you can make it lightweight, that means you have thin film on plastic, it becomes lightweight, the weight increases cost, and so if you could do that, if you could make thin film, the cost comes down. So the efficiency is the real game right now. And you ask the question, this is where the science and engineering comes in, it meets, the, you know, it meets the road out here, is that where is the efficiency gain most likely to happen? So here are the different technologies that are, you know, this is the efficiency, and these are the different technologies. This is crystalline PV, triple junction. This is uh, crystalline silicon, multi-crystalline silicon. SIGS is, you know, uh, copper, indium, gallium, selenide.
This is cadmium telluride thin film, amorphous silicon, organic PV. And what you find is this, this top level and, and this number out here is the theoretical limit. So there's something called, for a single junction cell, there's something called a Shockley quasar limit for, you know, for diodes, for photovoltaics. And uh, this 29%, actually for silicon is about 33%, but for the practical limit is 29%. And most of the production level silicon today, it's at about 23%, crystalline silicon. Polycrystalline silicon is at about 14% or so. So that's polycrystalline or multicrystalline. It's about 14%. So if we can get there, that's the headroom that we have. If you are looking at cadmium telluride, the production level is at 14%. In fact, the 70 cents of watt that I was talking about earlier was from cadmium telluride. That's the cheapest panel, and that's at 14%. That's the headroom. So the question is, how do we increase the efficiency? It all comes down to the material's growth. It all comes down to the defects and dislocation, how you make the contacts. The P contact is troublesome, so you've got to be improved. This is where science and engineering meets the, the business or the economics part of it. And if you can today come up with production level, and this has to translate to manufacturing, if you can get production level at 17 18% in cattail, that's a game changer. You already reach 50 cents a watt and reduce the balance of system cost as well. That's where the big race is going on. And someone's going to win the race. We don't know who. But that's where science and engineering and manufacturing really plays a role. If you're looking at solar and wind, storage is a big deal. You can integrate solar and wind onto the grid at about you know, 10 20%. You know, Ireland has done 40%. Germany seems to have done uh, 40 50% or so. But at some point, it is much better, much more reliable to have storage. And the cheapest way to, and cost again is very important, the cheapest way to store electricity is pumping water up a dam. And for installed cost, now this is not the levelized cost, but the installed cost of doing so is about $100 a kilowatt hour. Unfortunately, we don't have dams everywhere. So we said that could we create storage technologies, whether, whether it is compressed air, that you can deploy everywhere, or new electrochemical systems, batteries or flywheels and others that can bring down the cost that were at one point $400, $500, $600 a kilowatt hour. Can you bring it down to less than $100 a kilowatt hour? And that, that led to some major innovation and the ideas that we got were absolutely amazing. This is one of them. This is from uh, a gentleman from MIT, Yetmin Chang. And, uh, and he's part of a company called 20, 24M. He's the founder of, by the way, A123 also. And they're looking at a very interesting approach where the whole balance system cost of a battery goes down if you have a completely new architecture. This is taking the best of the chemistry of lithium ion battery, where you have intercalation chemistry, and turning that into a flow battery. And that it reduces the overall system cost much better than what a solid state battery, a lithium ion battery would, would do. And I won't go into the details. They're targeting $60 a kilowatt hour. And the name 24M comes because you want high molarity when you have a flow battery. And you can get to 24 molar solution if you have inter intercalation chemistry, which you cannot get with just solution process, you know, solution-based uh, batteries. And if they can get to even $80 a kilowatt hour, this is a game changer because the addition to the cost is about two cents a kilowatt hour to the cost of electricity from wind or solar, which is, will be amazing. Let me say very briefly about the grid. The grid is immensely important. We rely on the grid, of course. And this is what the United States looks like. But our grid is aging. We have about a trillion dollars of assets on the grid. And we are going to hit an asset wall. And I'm going to talk about that. But once in a while, you get this. And so the unreliability, and you know, we had this in 2003 in, in, in the East Coast. Just this year, we had one in San Diego. And the origins of the grid failure is about the same. Uh, there's a lot of institutional issues out here. And there's some technology issues as well. And the grid is aging. We had much of the infrastructure placed over the 1960s or 70s. And we are relying on that right now. And we need some major investments in our grid to modernize it. So what is a, this is just to give you one example of, of power electronics. This is a distribution level transformer. When you have transmission lines coming to a distribution network, you get distribution in you know, a substation where you have transformers to drop the voltage and increase the current. And this is a typical distribution transformer. This is about 8,000 pounds. It handles about a megawatt of electrical power. 
it's about 60 hertz, they, they run at 60 hertz. Uh, it, you know, you need a crane to install it. The design is almost the same that Tesla used about 100 years ago. It's not that different. Uh, it's improved. But the average age of these transformers on a grid is 42 years. And it's two years beyond is expected projected lifespan. That's where we are, okay? And we will have, that's why I said that we're going to hit an asset wall where many of these things are going to replace. And the question is, are we going to replace by using the same thing that we've done before, or could we do better? And that's the question that we asked in RPE. And so we have not, as a country, invested in power electronics. If you look at across the EE departments, I suspect it is the same out here. Most of the electronics people are in VLSI design or analog circuits or digital circuits. They're not looking at power. And there's a revolution that ought to happen, and it's happening right now, on the power side. Give, let me give you an example. You need wide band gap semiconductors. Silicon is not enough. This is a single transistor made of silicon carbide, okay, with, with four electrodes on it, that can handle 15 kilovolts dropping across a 200 micron thick of silicon carbide, which means it has to be defect free, dislocation free, et cetera. Otherwise, you get latch up. It can handle 100 amps which means it can handle about a 1.5 megawatts of electrical power going through a fingertip size, size, size device. And what they're trying to do is to operate at 50 kilohertz. This is Cree in, in South Carolina, or North Carolina. And 50, if they can run it at 50 kilohertz at higher frequency, the inductor size becomes smaller because the impedance is the same. And if the inductor becomes smaller, the whole thing shrinks. And they think it's going to be about 100 pounds. You can fit it in a suitcase and move it. You don't need a crane to install it. That's the kind of technology. I'm just giving you one example. There's a whole bunch of innovation happening on another wide band gap semi semiconductor, which is gallium nitride. And zinc oxide and others have not yet been used. And there's a huge opportunity out there to get into these new materials and device and new circuit topology to really look at, at power management. So let me switch to transportation. If you look at the transportation sector, this is how we use are, are fuels. Uh, you got about 60% in light duty vehicles, about 20% in trucks, and you got air, water, rail, pipeline, and buses. Buses actually is quite small. So what is happening in the transportation sector, and how can we reduce our fuel consumption, our carbon impact from these, from these vehicles? Well, if you look at, take a light duty vehicle, and ask the question, where is the, you know, where is the inefficiency? How can we reduce vehicle fuel consumption? Well, I won't go into the detail. It suffice to say that if 100% is a fuel energy, we use about 20 to 25% to actually move the car. Some of it is thermodynamic losses, which are part of Carnot and you know, part of uh, second law of thermodynamics. But there are other losses as well. And the question is, can we do better? Yes, we can do better. And of course, Princeton is very known, well known for its combustion research. There's a lot of innovation that can happen. This is a typical compressed a uh, compression ignition engine, a diesel engine, this is a spark ignition engine, and there's something that you could do with hybrid where you could go lean mixture and still get the same power. Okay, so there's, there's a lot of research going on, both computational and experimental, that I think will really add to making engines much more efficient than what we have today. But that's not enough. I mean, everyone wants to go, and if, I, if you tell me there's, there's someone who does not want, I'd like to know, everyone wants to go zero to 60 in five seconds. Okay, which means, you, you need a larger engine then, you need to increase the fuel consumption. But you don't need to carry with you the hunk of steel that you have. Maybe you can make it lightweight and still keep it safe. And so let me tell you where the opportunities are. This is steel. This is elongation when you manufacture, you have stamping, etc. And this is tensile strength. Today, most of the steel that we use or have a tensile strength of 300 megapascal or so, which means you need a hunk of stuff to make it in a, make, give it enough strength and, and compliance, etc. So that is what we use. Whereas if you go to high strength steel, you can get to about 1,000 or 1,200 megapascal, but your, your elongation, it becomes more, more brittle. It's not ductile enough. So the opportunity is how do you control the micro and nanostructure of steel? And people thought steel is, is mundane. No, it can be extremely helpful if you can get the same elongation of what a mild strength steel in the tensile strength of a high strength steel. And that does not exist today. This is plain old steel that we're talking about. This is, of course, carbon fiber composites. Today, it's about $15 a pound. 
if it can be brought down to $5 per pound, this is a game changer. And this is just for lightweight, and there's manufacturing processing. We don't make carbon fiber in the United States, and we buy all, all of that from, from Japan. And right now, BMW just announced that they're going to introduce carbon fiber in their cars at scale. And once that scaling happens, the cost will naturally come down. Uh, there's an opportunity right now to get involved. And in we, we had started a few carbon fiber composite in a programs, in fact, a big center at Oak Ridge to do this, to really address this. Let's talk about vehicle electrification. And that's a trend that we are seeing, um, driven much of that by, you know, by cafe standards. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. And it really comes down to batteries. Yes, there are things like you know, power electronics are needed, but the battery cost is the major one. And today, this is the, you know, we want to make electric vehicles, this is the initiative that we started, electric vehicles comparable in range and cost without subsidies by not 2012, but 2022. Sorry about that. I wish it was 2012, <laughs> but at 2020, in 10 years, can we make it? And the question is, what is the, what's the challenge? Well, today, the battery cost and the energy density are the two major things. The battery cost is about $650 a kilowatt hour of usable power because you don't go full depth of discharge. And the battery energy density is about 80 to 100, let's say 100 watt hour per kilogram. And if you want to go to all electric vehicles, let's say you go to a 100 mile electric vehicle, this has to be at $300 a kilowatt hour, and this has to be at 180 watt hour per kilogram. Let's say 200 watt hour per kilogram. So the energy density has to double, and the cost has to be half. Okay, that's, that's the game that we have to play. And if you want to go 300 miles, of course, it has to be even better. But let's talk about 100 miles, because most people drive every day about 100 miles or so. Now, this is the pack, the system-level energy density. That translates to, if this is 100, the cell-level energy density has to be 200. There's a factor of two you pay for packing in the system with all the packaging, et cetera. And so if this has to be 200, the energy density of the cell level has to be 400 watt hour per kilogram. And people thought this was impossible. Here is a technology from a startup company called Envia, uh, where it is some innovation in the material and the cathode side, which is manganese-based cathode, which is a layered spinel comp compound. And instead of using graphite, which is what you find in lithium-ion battery, they use silicon, which is almost 10 times the energy capacity, or lithium capacity, and they have increased, they've demonstrated with third-party validation, 400 watt hour per kilogram, which means the pack will be 200, and at a cost with 80% depth of discharge, with a rough cost of about $200 a kilowatt hour. So at the cell level, what we want to get at the production level at 10 years already exists today in the cell level. Of course, there's a lot of work to be done. So there's some amazing stuff going on in the battery, work, battery world that is, that is very, very interesting, and I think very promising. Let me talk about natural gas. We have found that the, one of the biggest game changes that has happened over the last you know, few decades, and especially over the last five years, is the discovery of natural gas. We use all of, almost all of it in the stationary system, but what is happening in trucking is something which is amazing. So this is the transition of our long haul trucking into LNG, liquefied natural gas. The additional cost that you have for LNG, extra cost for making a cryogenic tank, et cetera, is about $100,000, but the fuel savings from going from diesel to LNG is about $40,000 a year. So your payback period is about two and a half years, which is amazing. But not only that, you have the guys who put up the infrastructure for fueling station. Each fueling station like this costs about $1.6 million, and the payback period is also two to three years. So they asked us, should we be subsidizing this from the government point of view? I said, absolutely not. This is economically viable. Just get out of the way, let business play. And this company is now, is now putting up a whole network of LNG stations. And by, by middle of next year, they will be done every 200 miles because the range of these trucks is about 300, 400 miles. And every 200 miles, there'll be a little LNG fueling station along the trucking routes, and that'll be economically viable. And this is the business. The private sector is doing it, which is absolutely amazing. What is the difficult part of it is see if you can use natural gas in light duty vehicles, which is about 60% of our fuel consumption. And that's where science and engineering is required. Let me explain. So if you look at the infrastructure of gasoline stations today in, the, in our nation, we have about 160,000 gasoline stations. If you were to put the same infrastructure for CNG, compressed natural gas, it'll cost someone 
more than $100 billion, about $200 billion, to put the whole infrastructure. That, you know, frankly, the government doesn't have money right now. And the private sector has a chicken and egg story out here. Will there be cars that use natural gas? How can we put up the infrastructure if there are no cars? The car ma ma manufacturer is saying, well, <laughs> you know, if there's no free refueling station, how can we make cars? That's the chicken and egg story that's going on. On the other hand, there are 60 million homes that have natural gas. If we are willing to charge electric cars at home, maybe we're willing to charge our natural gas cars at home as well. Okay? In fact, you don't even have to, you can say bye-bye to the gas stations then. You just do it at home overnight. But here's the problem. Today, if you look, it's a really a storage challenge. Uh, today we have a Honda Civic. That's the gas tank in the Honda Civic to give you a range of around 200 miles or so. The energy density is the issue. And these are made of you know, some exotic materials. So you've got to look at that as a system. The compressor that compresses the gas and the tank. And that overall system cost has to be less than $2,000 to have a payback period for the price differential between gasoline and natural gas of about five years, which is a typical loan of a car. And today, it's about 10, you know, 10 to 15 years. And so you could go two routes. One is the high pressure route, where you need a multi-stage compressor to get to about 3,600 PSI, and you, that costs money. But you need also a carbon fiber composite tank to be able to handle that kind of pressure. Or you can go the low pressure route. You can take off the shelf compressor, but you need a sorbent material to be able to absorb all the natural gas. And that's where the chemistry of natural gas and sorbing, adsorbing material, chemi not chemisorb, but physisorb natural gas to have enough capacity. And that, those materials do not exist. So you can go different routes, which is where we created an RPE program to reduce the storage system cost to have a payback period of, three, of five years from what is now 10 to 15 years. And that needs some science and engineering of a system level as well as the materials level. Uh, very briefly about biofuels. Today, if you look at all biofuels that we talk about are photosynthetic biofuels. Uh, you have sunlight, you have carbon dioxide, and you have water. And we use the photosynthetic machinery in many forms, whether sugarcane, corn, algae, or cellulose, to make oil. That's simply how it works, okay, very, very simply. There's, of course, much more detail. What is often lost in this equation is the fact that this efficiency of most plants, not algae, most plants is less than 1%, which means you need a lot of land and you need a lot of water to be able to grow this. And it, because it's dilute, you will have to collect it from a bunch of region to be able to densify it. Because if you were to replicate oil, the density of energy density of oil is way higher than plants, at least the usable part of it. So if you look at the alternative, this is a study from the National Academies of what is the cost of alternative fuels 10 to 15 years from now. And this is coal to liquids. And by the way, there's a carbon tax. If you have $50 a ton of CO2, that's the, going to, that's the cost overall going to be. By the way, it's compared to $60 a barrel of, of crude oil, and this is $100 a barrel of crude oil. That's a comparison. This is biofuels, and there's a proposal of combining coal and biofuels. But let's talk about biofuels. This green part of it, which is the biggest cost, is the feedstock. That's the green feedstock cost because it is dilute. And it's really light and fluffy. You've got to concentrate. You've got to collect it. Today, the optimal collecting radius is 30 miles. And if you could raise it to 50 miles, it's a game changer. But there are various ways of doing it. This is one way to do it. <laughs> okay, Can't possibly do that in the United States. I don't think so. But what Brazil has done is to mechanize things and reduce the cost by, by, doing it in a, by introducing engineering, robotics, et cetera, into reducing the feedstock cost. And that's a lot of research really has to go in. And we could bring agricultural mechanization into biofuels production as well. And that, and frankly, if there's a demand for it, all the Caterpillar and all are waiting on, on the sidelines to do that. Um, that's one way to do this. The other way is to really engineer the plant from the genetic level. Do you really need to have the biggest problem, the reason you get 1% efficiency is what is called the Calvin cycle is really inefficient. There's an enzyme called Rubisco out there that gets corrupted by oxygen as you raise the temperature. Well, do you really have to use that cycle, or could there be other ways? And so we started looking at a completely new approach to biofuels 
that does not use the Calvin-Benson cycle, and we call it electrophiles. This is how it works. You don't have to use photosynthetic organisms. If you ask the question, what does photosynthesis do? Well, what does biology do? Well, in photosynthesis, what biology is doing is grabbing energy from the sunlight, and at the end of the day, making carbon-carbon bonds. You're taking CO2 and making carbon-carbon bonds because you cannot be better than biology in making carbon-carbon bonds. So we asked the question, do you really need the Calvin cycle to make carbon-carbon bonds, which is what you know, photosynthetic machinery is? There are many other cycles in biology that can you make carbon-carbon bonds that are there in organisms which are non-photosynthetic. And these are microbes that can, can do it. So we said maybe we could use those organisms which do not have the inefficiency of photosynthesis, and then we could feed in maybe electrons, renewable electrons, or there are many orga organisms that live on hydrogen sulfide, which is a waste product of, of oil and gas, or hydrogen, which comes from natural gas. We have an abundance of natural gas. And then take CO2 to really fix that into, nitrogen, uh, into oil. And we knew that based on the efficiency of the other cycles, this reverse Krebs cycle, woods lung dull cycle, I won't go into the detail, we knew that this would be more than 10%, more than 10 times more efficient than Calvin cycle. But it was, no one, no one had ever done it. We said, let's give it a shot and see whether we could create some new learning curves out of this. And sure enough, in, in about a couple of years, that's the first vial of a biofuel that came out of OPX Bio with NC State. First biofuel without the use of sunlight. This is directly from natural gas in a, with carbon dioxide and hydrogen, straight turn into fuel. This is really gas to liquids technology using biology. Of course, we don't know whether this is going to scale or not, but we showed it can be done. The next round would be the engineered, engineered system to see if it will scale in volume and come down in cost. And we hope it does, because then this will be an entirely new foundation of an entirely new industry that might happen. So this is just to give you a few examples of how we can create new learning curves that will buck the tradition of ex existing learning curves. But let me come back to this whole idea of the looking at energy systems as an ecosystem. You got R&D to translate science into innovative technologies. Uh, you got manufacturing, and manufacturing is really innovations in manufacturing in cost reduction and scale up, very important. And you have commercial deployment and you have markets where things are deployed. You gotta look at that as a system and you gotta streamline this. Because if, it is, if you take manufacturing out of the way, where will the R&D go? it'll go where the manufacturing is. And you've got to have markets to be able to deploy it, otherwise, you know, you can't deploy it. So there's a demand pull that is created in reverse, and there's an innovation chain that happens in forward. Of course, I'm simplifying it. And of course, I was talking about the, where the money comes from and how much money do you need. This is the typical time and money needed. You know, again, this is government R&D, that's the scale. And here's where equity and debt investments from, private, from public and private capital markets have to happen. And then, of course, you've got the markets out here. And the question is, could you align this in some way? Let me tell you what is out there as a proposal in the United States. And I'm going to give the United States a scorecard on this as well. This is what we have, CAFE standard, fuel efficiency standards, fuel. And that creates the market for innovative technologies. Because if you have to go to 54.5 miles per gallon by 2025, you've got to either do, this is a technology agnostic you know, policy where you could either make your engines more efficient and make lightweight, that's one way, or you can electrify, you could do other, th other ways as well. And that's, that's one approach. You've got renewable fuel standards, I wish it was there with a little more teeth in it. And you've got many other, you've got appliance energies, appliance standard, et cetera. Then you've got financing strategies, because for commercial deployment, you need money. And there are 1603 grants, which are grants in lieu of tax credits. The investment tax credits and production tax credits, clean energy bonds, master limited partnership, which is there only for oil, gas, and coal, and not there for solar wind. You know, talk about a level playing field. Okay, they've already picked the winners and losers out here. And of course, you know, the, you need manufacturing 48C is a, is a section 48C tax credit for manufacturing, et cetera. And in fact, all, almost all of them are coming to an end by the end of this year. Okay, that's where we have a major it's sort of, it's a precipice that we are on. And may, many of these incentives, financial incentives, are coming to an end. So that's where we are. So how are we doing in the United States? 
Okay, now I can look back, since I'm not a part of the government, I can assess. <laughs> I can be open about it. How are we doing? Well, here's a chart I created in a very simplistic form. It's not as simple. You got the stationary energy system, you got transportation. If you ask the question, do we have the capacity for technological innovation, it's a green. We absolutely have the science and engineering infrastructure. What we need is sustained, increasing funding for energy R&D. &D. Okay, whether it's RPE, Office of Science, Applied Energy Programs, the Department of Defense, NSF, Department of Commerce, we need that. In fact, we, there's been a lot of reports that have been written that our, the, the percentage of our GDP that we use for energy R&D is just abysmal. And what we also tell Congress is that do not give us a big spike in funding because we can't handle it. You've got to be able to spend money judiciously, so give us a ramp. And that's the right way to do that. Then he asked the question, do we have the markets for all these energy, new energy technologies out there? Well, I'll give a yellow for transportation because we have the cafe standards. And that is going to create a market for innovation. I wish we have a low carbon fuel standard with some teeth in it so that it enables the market for biofuels, et cetera. We really don't have. People pay the penalty and we are done with it. Okay? But if you look at what the, on the station energy systems, it's really a red. I wish we had a carbon price. We don't. We're not going to get it this year for sure. <laughs> we have an election coming up. Nothing is going to happen till the election. But post-election, I hope this is picked up again because a carbon price would create markets, will send a signal to the business. In fact, Bill Gates said it very well in our summit. You, don't need a, you can have a carbon price of zero right now as long as you have a carbon price of 20 30 40 $50 in 2025. That will send a signal. So push it back to the future. Make it zero right now so no one has to pay anything. But send a signal to the business community to transition out. Of course, appliance trend, I'm going to talk a little. This is probably the only green thing that has happened, building industrial codes and standards, et cetera. On the finance side, access to long-term, low-cost capital is a major issue. If you talk about solar, the fuel cost is zero. The capital cost is the main thing, and the cost of capital to, for that is one of the major issues. Uh, as I said, master limited partnership is a tax policy that reduces the tax burden, thereby reduces the cost of capital, and it's only available today for, for oil, gas, and coal. It's not available. This is, this is not a level playing field. And there are other real estate investment trusts Time, you know, if you're putting a tax credit, production tax credit, make it time limited and make it phase out so that people have a signal in the future. These do not exist today, okay? Or they come to an end and never continue or come in spikes. And that's not a way to run this. So if you were to create, you know, take this innovative technology, you want the United States to be the most innovative nation in terms of technology and markets, if you could create a few of these, then you really have a collection holistically of taking innovations and putting it in the market. A lot of people say, hey, uh, these standards are regulatory standards, regulation is bad. It increases the cost. You haven't taken cost into account because you're putting regulation. Let me tell you the story of applying standards. This is the dishwashers and the refrigerators and all. Let me tell you what happened after standards got created. This is the data. This is the price of the unit, this is refrigerator, room air conditioners, clothes washer, central AC. This is the price in equivalent dollars, and this, this is the red, and the blue is the life cycle cost. The dash line is when the standard was introduced in California, the dashed arrow, and the solid one are when was a federal standard. And this is one of the most effective ways. And what you find is that, yes, the life cycle cost came down after standards improved because it became more efficient. What was the most surprising thing is that the first cost, the capital expenditure of buying a unit, also came down by improving the technology. And he asked the question, why did that happen? And that's the paper that, was, that has just been submitted. Steve Chu is involved in this one as well, submitted to science. I hope they take it. That explains the whole thing and have a new way of looking at it where you know, innovation, when you create a standard and you do it the right way, the innovation that happens, the competition in the innovative ecosystem that happens brings down the first con and makes it cheaper. And that's an important thing out here. And so we have to be careful how you create standards, but regulation can actually be useful in bringing down the cost. So let me end with the following. If you look at the history of the United States, we seem to have a 50-year time constant for transitioning 
fuels. You had wood, then you had coal, there's a little bit of hydro, oil, uh, this is gas, a little bit of nuclear, and now the renewables out here. That's the history. We have a 50-year time constant. I'm not sure we have the time, we have the luxury of that this time, given what I showed you in the temperature distributions moving and we're reaching five sigma and things there. The impact of that is going to be much more expensive than, than using fossil fuel. So we ended the, our paper by saying, if you don't change direction soon, we will end up where we are heading. This is almost like a Yogi Berra saying, <laughs> where it's hard to predict, especially the future. It's kind of redundant, but that's how we ended. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you for a wonderful and uh, comprehensive talk. Um, sometimes I, I think people don't get it. I mean, even in this room, we have a whole bunch of incandescent lights up there. We only need enough projection here and enough for you to see what you're doing. And yet, um, uh, or if I go in Walmart, they, the new Walmarts have skylights, letting in sunlight, where that's about 90% efficient. Uh, but they keep the fluorescence on anyway. I mean, and, and you go in, so that's one thing I see. Uh, a question I have on a, a, a um, source of energy you didn't mention would be uh, deep geothermal, deep meaning three to five kilometers at least. Um, I mean, unless we yep. Yep. figure out how to harness casimir forces, uh, that seems like a, a good... Uh, yep, <laughs> casimir forces will be interesting. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, I think geothermal. Um, I think I think geothermal is certainly viable. Uh, we in fact funded a project for reducing the drilling cost. The drilling cost is a significant one for enhanced geothermal. There are there are some concerns though about geothermal. Geothermals happen where you have significant gradients, um, and they're also closely related to earthquakes. And there have been incidents in in Switzerland where that has happened. And one has to be careful about that, not to say that it cannot be done, should not be done, but I think care needs to be taken as to where you want to do it and how deep you really want to go and extract water or things. If you could do it without inducing you know, seismic activity, that would be the best, but I haven't seen anything yet. Maybe I'm, you know, I didn't see everything, so I agree with that. People identify themselves from here on when they ask questions, but who are you sort of You have the mic, yeah. Hi. Um, uh, one of the things, I mean, I saw, oh, I'm Dave Jones. I work in a local laboratory around here. Um, uh, one of the questions uh, that I didn't see addressed, uh, you know, there's all these, these little, uh, there's these great uh, improvements in efficiencies and cost. Um, but, for instance, if we look at wind power, we see uh, in the last several years that the lanthanide, um, World lanthanide sources, or which come out of China, uh, I mean, has anyone, or when you when oh, you absolutely. spoke about lithium, uh, you know, there is limited lithium reserve. Um, uh, where, how, when you're talking about 10 billion people or 16 billion people, we don't know how many people. Um, are we really looking for the real long term in this? I mean, there's a lot of risk in the carbon, yeah. at least the carbon cycle. I mean. Uh, 20 years, if we use the biofuel analogy and we projected 20 years ago, we, we certainly didn't account for the droughts around the world. So uh, can you comment on sure. how carefully you're looking at those? Yeah, actually there are two very significant reports that have been written on what are called critical materials that are potential have supply disruptions. There's a National Academy's report on that, and there's a report that was written by the DOE uh, after you know, several workshops bringing the community together on critical material where you have potential supply disruptions. Um, I'll take you, tell, tell you about one, and one is the one that is um, probably the most critical one is not lithium really right now, but it's magnets, is rare earths, um, 
you know, today's hard magnets that are used in wind generators, um, you know, they have their, their iron boride magnets with neodymium and dysprosium. And you need the neodymium to get the crystalline isotropy. You need the dysprosium for temperature stability. And we got, get about 90-something percent of that from China. And that's a vulnerability that we have. And China has, China's demand internally is more than its supply, which is why they had some issues with Japan and all that. It became a geopolitical issue. So we created a program. I said, could you? So what do we want from our magnets? We want what is called high energy density, the product of BNH, okay? High energy density inside a magnet, okay? Using, if you go back in the history, there were a lot of magnets tried out um, without the use of any rare earths. It's just that neodymium came around, and we stuck to that, and that's where we are today. There are interesting phases. There's a crystal structure. There's a material called iron nitrogen, where you got iron 16 nitrogen 2, which is a very anisotropic crystal that gives you a magnetic energy density, which is twice as that of today's magnets that has rare earths. But it's a very metastable phase that we could not get to. It, you, know, you could translate this to science and engineering and say that if you can make at bulk scale iron and nitrogen, which is abundant, into a magnet, you could not just reduce the rare earth content, you could eliminate the need for it because you've got iron nitrogen magnets. I think that's the kind of innovation. We saw multiple approaches, again, a portfolio approach, to really eliminate the need for rare earths. And I think you could do that similar kinds of things for others as well. But I would encourage you to read the reports on the critical materials uh, vulnerability for the United States. Yes. I'm, I'm Nima. I am uh, from the electrical engineering department. Um, my question is about, solid, uh, about uh, fuel cells in general. I've read quite a few texts in which they claim that Dr. Chu and Department of Energy are not big fans. But then looking at, uh, <laughs> looking at um, other economies, like in, in Norway, um, they, already have, uh, um, they, they already have industrial um, applications for, for, for fuel cells, and right. some companies like Toyota are, are investing in it. Uh, is there going to be uh, more funding for fuel cells? In of the, course. Uh, yeah. There will be funding for fuel cells. I'm not in the government, so I can say that. <laughs> Uh, actually, if you look at our paper in Nature, we have a whole section on fuel cells. And the fuel cells, you know, there's a lot of opportunity to bring down the cost, whether you can reduce the catalyst content. If you go nanostructured platinum, you can reduce the catalyst content, and you could do it that way. You can do a lot, a lot of system engineering, reduce the humidifier cost. I mean, there, there are opportunities to reduce the cost that we capture in our paper. But at the end of the day, the fuel cell is converting a fuel into electricity, that has to, you know, that's much higher efficiency than engines and, and, and other approaches, but it still has to compete on a dollar per watt basis with the other approaches as well. And we want to, the DOE is funding now research to bring down the cost so that at least people have the option and, and then let it compete in the marketplace with the other techniques. So that's going on right now. So, but yeah, and the funding, the funding has been cut because a lot of things have been cut. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's tough budget times. But we wanted to balance it out. But some people took it the wrong way. So not to lose time, hands up a little ahead of time. So you have two mics. There's one there. Someone else in this area? Where, where are you? All right. I'm Robert Cooper. I'm a grad student here. And I'm getting ready to head off for a postdoc, hoping to work on uh, direct production of biofuels from things like algae, cyanobacteria. Um, but so because I'm going into the biofuel space, I was curious. You talked about biofuels briefly, um, but you didn't mention the externalities. Like if you're going to do cellulosic biofuel, then you have the food versus fuel debate. Um, you need lots of water. You need lots of land. Um, and then Lossic, cellulosic, you may not have the food debate. Um, if, if you use cellulose, you know, the stock of a wheat plant and all that, you, or corn, you could use the cellulose, which is not used as food, and you could break it down to sugar and make oil out of it. So you and don't have the food debate. If, you only, if you're using corn, then you have a problem. Well, if you were using things like switchgrass, right, then that, that switchgrass is a, potentially a very good biofuel crop, yep. but it needs land to grow on. Yes, and that is true. It can grow on marginal land, but you can probably grow more on good farmland. Yeah. Um, 
so I mean, there, there just are some externalities like that. I'm sure you're aware. Yep. Uh, and then, with with the using electricity as uh, or natural gas as a fuel or a food source for the microbes, um, then that's it may end up still being net carbon, reducing carbon uh, in net. But then you're taking away energy that could be used elsewhere in the system. And then, so w with the thing about using photosynthesis is it may be inefficient, but it's using an energy source that is not being used elsewhere, potentially. Well, you, you could use photosynthesis even through the electrofuels. You can take a, put up a solar cell, which is 25% efficient, okay. way okay. higher than plants, sure. and use the electrons in a much more efficient cycle than a Calvin cycle to get biofuels. Okay. And you got to then look at the overall system efficiency to see what's the overall system efficiency from solar cells and all. So, you know, it's another option. And it's never been tried. And we said, let's give it a shot and see what happens. And eventually it has to, you know, it has to compete on an economic basis and the other exter externalities. If you can cost it, if, if you put the right cost for the externalities, that would be the right way to do it. And then let them compete. So, yeah, it does sound like a very interesting solution. I hadn't really heard much about it before. But I guess my question is, I know that RPE's goal is to cast as wide a net as possible and try everything that you possibly can. But not quite. <laughs> well, not, not everything, but everything that looks promising. Um, but if you personally had to choose one solution for transportation, considering all the externalities, everything, what do you think is most promising? Well, you know, there's one thing you learn in this business. There is no silver bullet. And you've got to have multiple options. And I don't think there's one solution that will solve everything for transportation. I think you, I believe in having the market pick that. But for us, at least when I was in the government, or even as scientists and engineers, to provide the options to see what, what is the best. I mean, you could go you know, electrification approach. You could take natural gas, you could do it biofuels, and all of them are viable. In fact, I was involved in, I was co-chairing for some time a, you know, um, a report from the National Petroleum Council on the future of transportation. And one of the good things out of the report, this is looking at 2050. And, and again, this is going back to Yogi Berra, you should never predict, especially the future, but we took a shot at it. And one thing that appears likely, and again, it's not for sure, is that right now we have only one option, which is oil, internal combustion engine. And that is vulnerability, if you have only one option. It is likely that we'll have multiple options which are about the same cost as oil and gasoline. And that cost could be lower than what it is today. And multiple options, lower cost, that's a good thing. And you know, let the consumers then pick what they want, and maybe some hybrids of these in the future. Question in front. My name is Stephen Mock. I'm a junior in the Woodrow Wilson School. So given that you're no longer in government, I was wondering what were the greatest challenges you faced sort of starting your own new agency within the Department of Energy? And then also, where do you see energy policy going given the current political landscape? The biggest challenge was recruiting. And it comes as a surprise to a lot of people, Recru recruiting really talented people to serve in the government for a few years is extremely hard. And, you know, and we did not, we said probably more no's than yeses, because we are very selective in who we recruited. But putting a team out there that is there for, and RPEs by statute can only be there for a few years and they have to go back and find a job or go back to the original job. You know, recruiting the right people was extremely hard. I spent most of my time recruiting, and of course I had to deal with a few other things as well. But, and so I appeal to you, if you get a chance, serve. Serve for a few years, because I think you'll get, not just for, you know, maybe you're just being a selfish reason, because it's an eye-opener. It was an eye-opener for me of getting a panoramic view of energy that I could never get in a Berkeley or any educational institution for that matter. So I would really encourage you for your own education or your own exposure to go and spend a few years in, in RPE for that matter, okay? Questions in back, go ahead. Hi, I'm Evan Lester. I'm a first year grad student in the Civil and Environmental Engineering Group. And I was wondering if you could comment on the, either the increased or decreased water use of a lot of these, uh, this portfolio of energy 
uh, water is very closely tied to a lot of power generation, so I was wondering if you could speak to either like the amount used or the impact on the quality of the water. Yeah, I mean, I, I frankly don't know enough about it to be able to say anything really intelligent. Um, the only thing I would say is that the water use in power generation uh, is a major thing. EPA is coming up with a rule to reduce the water use. Um, there is some technological challenges out here. If you could come up with a heat exchanger on the, on, uh, for heat dissipation from a power plant that could directly dissipate to air without the use of water at cost, that would be a major innovation. You would make a lot of money if you could sell that to power generators, okay? Um, so I think that's, that's one of the advantages. You know, if you look at natural gas, combined cycle, uh, that's a better option in many ways than Rankine cycle, where you use water uh, for cooling, et cetera. So, I mean, I think there are advantages that you'll see, and I think the EPA ruling, when it comes on, comes on board, will, have, will, will tend to shift the, the mix of uh, energy producers. In that sense, going to solar and wind and oil makes a lot of sense. One final question in the back. My name is Christopher Gordon. I'm a sophomore in the chemical and biological engineering department. In light of all the um, carbon and carbon dioxide that's being emitted into the atmosphere right now and what is projected to be emitted, is there a way of turning that into a good thing? In your opinion, what's the best and most viable option of turning carbon into, let's say, a fuel? Carbon into what? A fuel. Well, I mean, that's what the whole biofuel thing is about, right? If you look at the amount of carbon that is emitted, you know, some 30 gigatons of carbon dioxide that is emitted per year, that's more carbon than any other product combined. All other product, you know, petrochemicals and everything combined, is the amount emitted from fossil fuels. Correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know if I, you, you would know this better than I do. Right. Yeah. So the, if you really want to close the cycle <laughs> of carbon that you emit and make it a closed loop and make it sustainable in that sense, there's no other option but to make it into fuel. You're absolutely right. And to do that, you need an energy because you're going up the free energy landscape. Right? And so the question is, how do we do that in a cost-effective way? So biofuels, using plants is one way. Using electrofuels is another way. And, you know, there are a few other ways. And I think that's the long-term sustainability question is, could we make a closed cycle out of this so that your net emission is minimized? Let us thank our speaker for an inspiring talk. Thank you. Thank you.